The Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. All right, joining us on uh, this episode of the Canola School here on Real Agriculture, we're pleased to welcome Chris Mancher, agronomy specialist with the Canola Council of Canada. And uh, Chris, prior to joining the Canola Council, you actually did your master's on a topic uh, that I think canola growers across Western Canada will be quite interested in. Producers of all crops, I think, would be quite interested in, and that is RNA interference technology. Can you explain what RNAi is and, and the concept, how it could apply to canola? Yeah, so RNA interference, or we call it RNAi for short, uh, comes from this very ancient pathway that all organisms almost have. And this is a pathway that they actually used to communicate with each other for uh, defense responses. So some people took, uh, some really brilliant scientists actually had the idea, what if we could actually use this to help protect our plants from a variety of pe- uh, pests, such as like insects, pathogens, or even viruses. So to get a better understanding of this, we kind of have to think about Uh, where we are at in the pesticide industry right now. And right now, almost all of our pesticides, they took a look at inhibiting uh, proteins, you know, or enzymes. Uh, And so you design a certain molecule and then it inhibits something inside the organism and then it dies off. So that's on the protein side. But when we think about uh, how molecular biology works, it goes from DNA to RNA to protein. So RNAi just takes it one step backwards and starts targeting the RNA in that pest organism. So so this could potentially be used to protect plants against specific insects, specific fungal diseases, all kinds of things that cause us issues when we're growing a crop. Exactly, yeah, because the active ingredient is actually an RNA sequence that we can tailor it to any kind of organism. So every organism has its own set of sequences for that that are unique to that. So we can engineer them to target uh, specific canola pests such as flea beetles or even sclerotinia. And there's actually been a lot of research already starting to take a look into that as well. Okay. So RNAi, this would be a product that you apply with your sprayer on the crop, or it could also be integrated into the genetics of the plant itself. Is that is that accurate? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's kind of two different pathways we can take for this. We got uh, a foliar application where we actually spray them on just like any other kind of pesticide, or we can actually create transgenic plants that actually express these sequences inside them itself. So once that or um, pest organism goes and feeds on it or um, ingests anything, it'll om- automatically take that in. Okay. You mentioned flea beetles. Uh, the last few years, there's been situations in parts of Western Canada, I think, where growers have been looking for a light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to managing flea beetles. Is that uh, RNAi? Is that part of that uh, light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, I think it could be. I mean, this is just another tool in the toolbox along with proper management techniques and our current insecticide regimes. Uh, RNAi, we could potentially see, you know, transgenic plants that uh, could be resistant to flea beetles or we could spray, you know, this almost new mode of action onto them to help either supplement our current insecticides or be an alternative to that. Okay. So the big question then is, how far away is this technology and what are the obstacles or the hurdles it still has to clear when it comes to regulatory and all the other approvals that uh, would have to be in place, checks and balances that have to be in pl- done, gone through before we can actually be using it on commercial field? Yeah, so we'll start with the good news a little bit. Uh, manufacturing these molecules is now actually just as cheap or even cheaper than traditional pesticides, so that's a really big plus. Uh, the other things too are that we've seen efficacy in a lot of different organisms. This has been studied for you know a couple decades or so now. Uh, but yeah, the big hurdles now are a lot of these field tests to make sure that these formulations actually work in real world settings. We need to find the right kinds of uh, additional chemicals to make sure it sticks to the plant, to make sure it gets into the insect or that pest. Uh, and then also the regulatory uh, aspect of that. Being that it's very environmentally friendly, that it degrades in the soil and water very rapidly and is only toxic to the pests that we're targeting, uh, that should be pretty favorable in a regulatory sense. Okay. There is already an example in the U.S. of RNAi technology being applied in corn, I believe. Is that right? That's right, yeah. So there is uh, an event that we can see it actually being a transgenic one against the western corn rootworm. So that's a really big plus. And we also see some other companies that are taking a look at it as a uh, topical application for, say, bees to protect them against varroa mites. Okay, so that goes back to what you were saying in terms of 
positive environmental aspects to this as well. What what kind of issues are there in terms of persistence or potential issues that we see with other traditional pesticides when it comes to environmental exposure and, and those types of things? Yeah, so uh, going back to like, uh, as RNAi is uh, species specific and sequence dependent, uh, even if it does persist in the soil or the environment, it isn't going to impact anything other than the organism that we're targeting for. But also on the bright side, uh, because RNA is somewhat uh, unstable outside of its protected environment, say inside a plant, uh, when it comes into contact with, say, a lot of uh, moisture from, say, rain or in our waterways, or in the soil through the microbiome there, it'll actually get readily degraded and become just harmless uh, and, yeah, be great. Okay, so you don't see any major obstacles on that side of things? No, not at this point. I mean, it's... Um, we haven't seen anything in the literature right now to suggest otherwise, I'd say. What about the, the social aspect when it comes to the approval of new technology? Of course, we have many examples in our, our food system of, of technology and society being wary of, uh, of new things on that front. Yeah, so I think it's always good to keep uh, a progressive mind looking forward towards new technologies for this, especially ones that really complement all our kind of sustainability objectives, whether it's for the environment, for the economics, and also the social implications that we know that we're applying products that are actually good for all of us involved. Okay. Finally then, Chris, the big question, do you have a timeline on how soon farmers in Canada could, uh, could see this technology? Yeah, that's a difficult question because, you know, it could take... Uh, a few years to you know up to a decade or so I mean I'm very optimistic that we can see it in you know five to eight years but uh, I would say we keep on marching along with the research right now and uh, knowing that we have a lot of priorities for major pests like flea beetles like in this field uh, I really like to see this advance more yeah any shout out to your former uh, research colleagues I know some of them are at the University of Manitoba just down the road here that's right, yeah. Dr. Uh, Mark Belmonte and Steve Wired, uh, they were my mentors at, during my master's degree there, and they've worked on uh, research with sclerotinia. It's what I worked on, and uh, overall, very positive environment there, and they're doing some great stuff. Cool. Well, we're definitely following as, uh, as these developments come closer to, uh, to a field near us, I guess. Thanks for your time, Chris. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Kelvin.